Hi, and welcome to a journey in the world of blue spinels. What do blue spinels inspire you? I would assume not so well defined octahedrons on white matrix, generally thumbnail specimens. Actually, blue spinels come in a variety of shapes, colors, transparency, and vividness. And while most crystals are somewhat rounded because of their alluvial origin, a few occurrences host specimens on matrix. Let's start by exploring the diversity they offer before diving further into the details. Sri Lanka and Burma have been a source of dark blue spinels for a very long time, the color of which has been referred to J by the trade. Here are six more examples of this peculiar hue courtesy of gem matrix. Vietnam has a great range of tones with very very pale stones from bison and lung tin deposits uh, which are illustrated here on the right and medium grayish blue hues that exhibit a striking color shift phenomenon upon different lighting conditions. Here um, stones have been shot under regular daylight and on next slide, um, it will be under artificial lightning. And these stones are coming from the Bai Broid deposit, which was discovered a year ago in the vicinity of Lukien, Vietnam. So here is the color change, quite striking actually. Which raises the question of how to define where the blue color stops and where the periwinkle, pastel, lavender color stars. It is Kind of tricky because these pinels actually offer a continuous spectrum of hues. Here I illustrated another selection of Vietnamese stones exhibiting very strong saturation, all of coming from Lukian. So the vividness of blue spinel can be as intense as the so-called neon cobalt spinels which prices can reach 10,000 US dollars for one carat stones. But not all blue spinners achieve that highly coveted denomination given by the trade to describe this very fantastic glowing color. All of these are blue spinners. There are even cobalt spinners. Maybe not these two, I reckon, a bit too grayish. But what are actually spinners in the first place? Spinels has a very simple formula. It's magnesium, aluminium, oxide. Or is it that simple? Actually, spinel is more of a family of double oxides with one divalent 2 plus iron and two trivalent 3 plus cations. And metals from the group D, like iron or zinc, are actually good candidates for substitution in the A or B sides. So this is actually what the cation can look like when incorporated and it's actually quite diverse. And that diversity is at the origin of all the colors which can be displayed. So without expanding too much on this, manganese and to a lesser extent vanadium make yellow spinels if left alone as they have a very faint coloring power, but they are easily overcome by stronger chromophores like iron, cobalt, chromium. And as a result, we end up with all those you that color the whole rainbow with extensive overlap of these colors. So a bit of structural mineralogy now. Um, divalent and trivalent cations at their respective location in the, spital, in the spinal crystal cubic cell with octahedral sites called M in here, um, which are located for three plus ions like aluminum and tetrahedral sites illustrated here. T sites are being reserved for two plus ions like magnesium or cobalt two plus, for instance. But laws are meant to be broken and crystallographs have actually witnessed inversion to up to 14 persons which means that ions like, let's say, aluminium 3+, plus, which are supposed to be in the octahedral site, can end up in the tetrahedral site. And iron 
2+, plus, which is supposed to be in the tetrahedral site, can end up in the octahedral site sometimes. And these possible substitutions are making the formula much more complete, much more, much, much more complicated, and we are getting quite far from where we started uh, with the ideal formula. Um, the spectra of the two blue spinners presented here um, have been representing with the equivalent bluish color. And please note that these are actually blue even though they lack cobalt. Indeed, as shown as in the ternary diagram, spinels with divalent, so 2 plus iron, ferrous iron, can actually have light blue, light pink, pale lilac color, whereas the trivalent, so ferric iron, tend to display a stronger, deeper green. So you see within the same elements, the valence 2 plus, 3 plus, influence the, um, the color and has a differential effect. So without going too much into the details, the purpose of this slide is to show you that an apparent simple absorption spectrum, like here, is actually the sum of multiple effects, like the ligand to metal charge transfer, or the valence of the cation within the given octahedral coordination, or the electronic intervalence charge transfer. The latter being actually dependent on the concentration of iron in the system with differential outcome as indicated by the shifting color or the peak value in the visible range. So this is an illustration of the effect of increasing total iron content considering the nonlinear octahedral intervalence charge transfer we just discussed before in this spinel hercinite solid solution, which is like spinel and iron rich spinel. It actually makes the color vary from pale lilac to sky blue to green and even deeper green. And such um, a variation is just explained by one of the bands we saw. Um, so all of this is to tell you that actually the blue color in spinels is quite complex. So this is another one more example with proper pictures of the sample this time displaying various hues inherited through the effect of iron. So another illustration is going to be taking place next slide and I promise I won't be extending much further on that geochemistry because I lack time actually. Um, but um, please have a look at the literature, it's very, very interesting. So all of these spinels here have the effect coming from iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus mostly. You can have the contribution of secondary ions like titanium, vanadium, chromium, but the, the bulk of the signal is actually carried by those iron um, ions. And whether it's manganese or zinc actually doesn't matter much. In that instance, um, these are spinels or actually garnite because it's like zinc dominant member uh, are coming from Nigeria. And once again, um, that's the iron component in them, which is responsible of the color. And if you have a look, these are all the details of what's going on in the spectra. And you'll see all the effects are actually related to iron. So not the single trace of cobalt in those, and yet they have a very desirable blue. So to put it simply, spinels are actually a mixture of an element in the tetrahedral site, which has normally a two plus valence, but can accept a certain degree of substitution with elements normally found in the hog territory site, which on a regular basis has three plus ions, trivalent ions. And on this very slide, I tried to um, put a color, give a color on the elements, but as we've discussed before, um, it's within a given element, you can't have the same color if these, for instance, display a variation due to the quantity itself. Some, sometime 
depending whether it's in tetrahedral coordination or hexahedral coordination, the same elements, cobalt 2 plus, can actually change color. So we've seen that iron is responsible for a bluish, slightly grayish color, and that cobalt spinels are, have a very, very desirable neon color. And as such, they are submitted to GEM Labs for reports. But it's not already very consistent because there is no proper definition. And even though analytical techniques may be able to detect cobalt traces as low as one part per million, one ppm, the sole presence of cobalt can't be used as a quarantine or the vividness that the trade is going for. Indeed, for a given concentration of cobalt, the larger the stones, the deeper the stones, the, the stronger the effect, and the more concentrated the color will appear. Yet, fixing 20 ppm or 50 ppm as a threshold to qualify um, that given property of the cobalt spinel color won't work because of that issue with the depth of the stones. And actually, cobalt is a very powerful coloring agent at very low concentration. And the presence of other chromophores like iron can actually overcast the shadow on the original U. Hence, GIA has tried to define a nomenclature based on both the iron and the cobalt content, and insisting on the relative concentration of both elements. But defining a cobalt spinel against its iron content is kind of counterintuitive. So um, others, authors have suggested an indicative maximum ratio of 10 iron for one cobalt, but um, we'll show later on that actually it's not really solving the issue. And seeking an absolute answer to the question of what a cobalt spinel is might actually be quite irrealist. So the question is now, is it cobalt or is it not cobalt? And um, even if this 10 to 1 rule seems to work within a given range of values, we've shown that iron is actually behaving in a non-linear way. And so keeping this rule won't work for all of um, the concentration. Like even if the ratio is always 10 in here, because the effect of iron is different at different concentration, you can't you, you can't use this. Um, one cannot mix potatoes and carrots except if they are making soup. So let's not compare those two when you can't actually. So maybe a better way and consistent non-destructive technique to quantify and qualify the color um, could be to use uh, such diagrams, which seems to be the st standard among scientists studying pigments and ceramics. Um, then it would obviously raise the question of how to define a boundary and should this be a hard boundary or soft boundary? How do you in take into account the continuity that exists in, in that continuum? More questions than answers, but maybe this would, would be helpful, I reckon. Anyway, the trade agrees that this parcel of saturated electric blue rough is worthy of the denomination cobalt spinels. And okay, maybe not for these larger stones, but you can still see how this, this is glowing, this is neon, very saturated. And if buyers and sellers agree, what, is there a need for anything else? Let, let's push this a, a bit too far and go to the next step. What if we make actually cobalt dominant spinels? Those exist and are referred to as cobalt aluminates. And there is a, a complete solid solution between pure spinel and those cobalt dominant spinels, as you can see here, going from 006 to 087 and from 0 to 70. So we can inverse them backwards. If you actually make that powder, it's, it's very vivid, it's very nice, but you need to have a very small crystal shape, like in the matter of 
tens of nanometers. Um, so you can have that colors. Otherwise, it's just not not what you're looking for. And so, well, all thing considered, as long as your spinel, no matter how much cobalt it has, has that very desirable color, then you're free to call it cobalt. And indeed, when issuing reports for other gemstones like current businesses are not really focusing on trace elements um, to give the color name, no one has ever had a look at the content of iron or titanium or chromium and vanadium and that ratio of your iron to decide if a ruby is actually a pigeon blood or not a pigeon blood or um, is the sapphire a cornflower or a peacock or a velvet color based on titanium and iron? No, just based on visual estimation. So it's all about the, the perceived color in person and the hype that exists around blue spinners is about the incredible vividness. It's not about a ratio extremely arbitrary. So let's close the topic on this. So if we are interested in blue spinels, a good reminder would be that blue spinels are actually spinels which are not, not blue. And that's quite interesting because to have a blue spinel, you need either the, that iron or that cobalt, but most importantly, you don't want to have the chromium or the other chromophores that might turn that blue into a purplish color. So how can you avoid this? And how do these elements come together to form the spinels? And where is the aluminium from the spinels hosted? and how are these elements reconcentrated and then deposited? Um, we'll try to go through this question. So we've seen that iron can turn a very vivid blue cobalt spinel into a darker stone. So our aim here is to get rid of that excessive iron. And one way to do it is having a source of sulfur that can help forming pyrotides and thus reducing the availability of iron in the system. And as long as that sulfide has a greater iron over cobalt ratio than that of the spinel, it's acting as a trap and thus it's leaving more cobalt available for the spinel. So this is um, an example of um, a pyrotite that was found in, in Vietnam. So it's definitely a mineral that is present in there, not obviously visible uh, for the bare eye because it's mostly traces, but it, it does matter as uh, we, we are seeing. And um, these are some analysis of pyrotite from Canada. And you can see that the, the ratio of um, iron over cobalt is far greater than the ratio we've seen within the spinels, which means that actually pyrotite is a trap. So what actually makes a deposit? So we're gonna have a look at um, two different places. Um, I might not have time to describe fully uh, what's going on in this area, but a research paper published in 2019, 54 pages of very interesting science. Please have a look. It's um, I won't be able to go into the details, but it's very interesting. So if you try to display pictures of blue spinels in the Mindad gallery, you'll end up seeing that most of the times um, spinels are associated with these minerals. And something which you might not have seen first is that all of these are actually silicates. So where's the silica coming from? And what information can we have from those groups, those halogens? What, what information are they providing this regarding to the petrogenesis of these minerals? So um, Chaviré has drawn what seems to be lances that happened in the marble in Vietnam, where blue spinels are associated with olivine and to the surrounding parkside. So at first sight, olivine in marble can be kind of surprising. It's not something we're used to see. And actually quite a few authors have tried to give an explanation to the reason for, for this. 
um, one is the input of silica um, by contact metamorphism um, and and actually it can also happen if you already have silica in your system and it's just being remobilized without a, needing an external source for it and um, so the equation is quite actually simple um, two dolomite plus silica make phosphorite plus calcite and co2 and then you can have obviously variation especially if you are getting more elements in your system but um, this is a way to explain the presence of phosphorite so olivine um, not only is this visible in matrix you can have um, blue spinels that actually have uh, phosphorite crystals um, within them and if you are remobilizing that olivine um, and you end up having some calcite for whatever reason in your system and still some silica available around you can turn the original olivine into dioxide so calcium mag magnesium and the silica and this can be detected in the blue spinels too as illustrated here with an example from madagascar um, so as i just told earlier the system can be quite complex whenever you get source of alumina calcium magnesium iron and on the very last bit of the tetrahedron silicon silica um you end up with these different rock types so the marbles that most of the people know of the calcite rocks which we'll will emphasize a bit later on and the saconite i'm just um naming them for the the sake of of it um but i won't have time to extend deeply on this um even though they are actually quite interesting and have um yeah very peculiar mineralogy so this is a mineralogical assemblage found in Baffin Island so in Nunavut Canada um and please have a look at the paper it's very very interesting um so what you can see in here is that calc silicate pod um in there that is in direct contact to a pargazite calcite uh, rock which is itself in contact with a marble unit and um, what you will see on the next slide is actually a, a close-up of um, that calc silicate pod with a green pargazite and a green so here here is a close-up you obviously get the blue spinels the calcite and then the pargazite and uh, scaphorite as described earlier um, you also have phlogopite so the magnesium potassium um, mica some relics of muscovy the spinel of course and some calcite um, so this is what the silicate rich spinel bearing rocks look like but you can have different assemblage with some of these missing um, the role of the mica um, is actually quite prominent and uh, if you have a look at that research paper um, it's especially explicit about potassium depending on the given rock the effect of potassium is completely different within the marble units and within the uh, calc silicates ones um, it all has to do with uh, competition between forming the phlogopite if you have too much potassium or the, the aluminium or actually forming the spinel if you have um, enough aluminium and not so much potassium and um, so you can have intergrowth like in here or, or illustrated in here in uh, spinel and phlogopite both from um, the area south of Lukien, uh, Vietnam the study of fluid inclusion done by Garni shows that evaporite is actually key to explaining the formation of these deposits as molten salts like halite and sylvite and gypsum are actually providing um, to some extent some fluorine and chlorine that are remobilizing the chromophoric elements um, plus there is some devolutization of co2 released by the carbonates 
and we can have proof of that high sodium chlorine and fluorine content if you have a look at uh, the peroxide edge lights. So all these amphiboles are bearing quite a significant amount of those halogens. So this leads to quite special fluid inclusion chemistry with um, sulfur being represented across all these different molecules. And it's believed that um, it was actually produced by the thermal reduction uh, with organic matter from the sulfates, maybe from gypsum. Um, organic matter being itself reduced um, to graphite um, during the metamorphic process. So in this study, the focus is given on the different uh, rocks bearing spinel, either the marble or the calx silicates, and how they can be defined with an aluminum over silicon ratio, the weight of um, sodium, magnesium, calcium, the different relative contribution, the halogen, how they have bearing signal from um, evaporite deposits, and how can all these elements be uh, traced back to the original protholith and um, um, by creating back the original dolomite, calcite and silica sand content, uh, inferring the mud content, um, it can be uh, plotted against a graph and would indicate that actually mole protolith uh, would favor the gem mineral genesis. That's what we are seeing here. Um, if you want to create uh, gem spinel bearing rocks, you need no sand or very little amount of sand, otherwise you end up with too much silica. And most importantly, you need carbonate with some extent of mud, otherwise you won't have the aluminium needed um, to get the spinels. Um, quickly, the edge of spinel deposit is is actually quite diverse. On this map you can see that uh, Hunza, um, Pakistan and the Vietnamese deposit behind me um, are actually all related to the Himalaya erogeny, so quite recent, Miocene, 10, 18 million years old, Eocene at Lokian, which is a bit, a bit older, but nowhere near uh, um, the Paleoproterozoic age of the Canadian occurrence, which is 1.8 billion years. Um, so in Vietnam, you can you can see that there is a absolute structural control over um, the, the deposits. This is even more obvious with the second map. Um, I won't spend too much time in here, but um, both uh, ruby sapphires deposit and blue spinels uh, are actually related because. Um, of that sedimentary protholith, um, then you end up with um, related deposits. So quickly, the temperature needed to create the spinels uh, in Anfu, which is like south of Lukian in Vietnam, was about 690 degrees. So to sum up the geochemical control, um, we can say that it's mostly a highly temperature medium pressure metamorphism of platform carbonates and which if we want more information regarding the origin of the cobalt um, while Chauvery expressed that it could come from nearby amphibolites it's been uh, rejected by Bailey based on its observation in Canada um, actually could come um, from a prior an origin prior to regional metamorphism either as a result of cobalt-rich um, sediments inputs or orthogenic enrichment during sedimentation, diagenesis or low-grade metamorphism. Actually, cobalt and nickel can be enriched in oxidic sediment near the sediment water boundary um, during early diagenesis. And these oxidic conditions um, can result simultaneously in the loss of chromium and vanadium, which it's observed um, in Canada, so it fits quite well the data. And finally, once you've done your spinels, um, you need to avoid red dissolution, otherwise you could lose them, and then you can recrystallize, and this is what is happening in that sample here. You see all of these have a same oriented growth against the given direction, 
and um, well, it seems to be lots of nucleation too. So um, luckily, those have not dissolved completely. Have a look at the literature; it's quite interesting. And if you have questions, please um, send me an email or contact me through social media. Thanks.